Once again, just talking about taking God at his word, seeing him at work in our everyday lives. Uh, as we left chapter 5, Moses confronted Pharaoh face to face. And though Moses had been told by God that Pharaoh would not let his children go, Moses still had the expectation that this confrontation would end a little bit differently. And we talked about expectations and how we all have expectations of what God is and is not going to do in our lives. And instead of things getting easier for the children of Israel, things got much, much more difficult. Remember, Moses was told by the children of Israel, he said, you have caused us to reek in the sight of Pharaoh. And uh, Pharaoh couldn't handle the idea of my work ceasing. And remember, that's Pharaoh's work. It wasn't God's work, it was Pharaoh's work. And he didn't want to see it to end, so he, he put his taskmasters in place and made them work even harder, trying to get the work accomplished. But just when you think things couldn't get any worse, Moses realizes that the people that God called him to lead didn't really want anything to do with them. And remember, think about this. This is not just a few hundred people. It's not just a couple thousand people. I mean, there are, there are numerous, numerous people here. And uh, I don't know if you can put an exact number on it, but in, in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23, it says, So Moses went back to the Lord and asked, Lord, why have you caused trouble for this people? So now Moses, because the expectations were not as he thought they would be, he begins to look at God and say, God, why have you caused this trouble? God didn't cause it. But he goes on and says, well, why did you ever send me? Ever since I went into Pharaoh to speak to your name, he has caused trouble for this people. And you haven't delivered your people. God, you didn't do what I thought you should do. Hmm. You ever thought that way before? You ever thought, God, why did you do this? Why did you allow it to happen this way? Why didn't you let it happen the way I thought it would happen? And sometimes we realize, once again, we're reminded all over again, that God doesn't always work how we want Him to work. Right? We want to put God in a nice little neat box, and we're, we have this situation taking place in our life, and we're going to go to God, and we're, we're going to say, God, do this, and God's going to do it, and we're all going to go away happy, right? That's not always the way God works. God allows things in our life that we wouldn't choose, that we wouldn't pick, but he's got a greater plan. We've been seeing this over and over from chapter 1 all the way up to the present. That God is working something greater and bigger than what's immediately in front of them. Something behind the scenes. So as we dig into chapter 6 and a little bit into chapter 7, um, we're going to take notice of at least three principles that we must be reminded of in our daily lives. And I hope as we look at these things this morning, we're going to be just, once again, just challenged and encouraged to take God at his word. To know that God doesn't make any mistakes in our lives. That he knows exactly what he's doing. And so let us incur, be encouraged this morning to, to learn these three principles. First of all, we find it in chapter 6, verse 1. In fact, there's a couple of them there. It says, But the Lord replied to Moses, Now you are going to see what I will do to Pharaoh. He will let them go because of my strong hand, and he will drive them out of his land because of my strong hand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we look at your word this morning, Lord, that you might teach us what you want us to know, that you might remind us of those things that maybe we've learned before but have forgotten. And I ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts in such a way that as we leave this place, that we'd be reminded to be faithful to your word and faithful to your principles. And God, be with each one of us here today, Lord. I know that a lot of us have kind of, in a, in a roundabout way, experienced dealing with expectations and wanting things to unfold in life a certain way, and not realizing that you had other plans, or not willing to concede to your plans. God, forgive us, and I pray, God, that you'd help us to understand what you are doing in our lives, that we might take you at your word and trust you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the first principle I want us to learn this morning, or be reminded of this morning, is this. God tells Moses that he is going to see what he can do. You know, so often we go about life seeing what we can do, right? We go by our own information, we go by our own abilities, we go by our own skill set, we go by our own experiences, and we try to work out all the circumstances of life based off what we know we can do and what we can handle. But the first thing that God reminds Moses of is this, is that Moses is going to see what God can do. Moses had gotten a glimpse of what he could do, but he was about to see what God could do. 
Why is this an important principle to understand? Well, so often we go through life doing what we know to do. And God says we're to walk by faith and not by sight. And far too often, by doing what we can see, we can't see the whole picture. And we must be dependent upon God to do what only God can do. And so we need to realize it's not about what we can do, but it's trusting God to do what only He can do. And Moses still hasn't grasped this concept completely, that it was God who is controlling the outcome and not himself. And so often in circumstances of life, we think we are actually going to control the outcome. News alert, God's in control. God's word even reminds us that even the king's hand is in the heart of God, or the king's heart is in God's hand. And the bottom line is there is times in our lives that we may think that we're controlling or so-and-so is controlling, but God is in the background. He's always at work. He's always doing things. And even though we can't see it, God is at work. So Moses hasn't grasped this concept completely. Who is controlling the outcome? Not himself. Moses is still holding on to his, if I could say it this way, his speech crutch. And he's, what do you mean by that? Well, look at Exodus chapter 6 and verse 12. But Moses said in the Lord's presence, If the Israelites will not listen to me, then how will Pharaoh listen to me, since I am such a poor speaker? He said, God, nobody's listening to me. You want me to go in there? You want me to confront Pharaoh? I've done that. Nobody listens. Well, duh, Moses. He said, I told you to go, and I told you he's not going to let him go. But go anyway, because that's what I told you to do. But Moses is looking at the physical circumstances, and he's saying, well, they're not going to listen to me. Uh, you know, I, I don't speak very well. I mean, remember, that was one of his main excuses a couple chapters back. Over and over, He's thinking it's about him and up to him to control the circumstances. But we realize that he can't. In fact, in, in Exodus chapter two, uh, 6 and verse 3, he says, But Moses replied in the Lord's presence, Since I am such a poor speaker, how will Pharaoh listen to me? So he's holding on to this crutch of his poor speaking. And I think this is true. As long as we are holding on to a crutch of any kind, it reveals that our faith, trust, and confidence in ourselves is in ourselves rather than completely in God. Do you understand what I'm saying here? He's saying, I can't do this because of my speech. And what we need to understand is that when God asks us to do something, it's not about our abilities. It's not about what you think you're good at. It's not about what you think your uh, skill levels are. It's all about what God says to do and what God says He's going to do through you. So he's holding on to this crutch. Well, I can't speak very good, God, and they're not listening to me so far. And you, by the way, you've caused this to be a trouble for me. Play the violin. It's not about Moses. It never has been, never will be. He was just a tool. But the question that comes to my mind is, what kind of crutches do we hold on to? Well, I have this task that I want you to do, and then we look at God and say, well, God, you know, financially, I can't handle that one right now. And God says, well, I want you to do this. Well, you know, God, physically, I'm not in very good shape. And, you know, I'm getting a little bit older in years. Or, or maybe I'm not quite there yet. God, I can't do this. And we use it as a crutch to not do what God's asked us to do. You know, maybe it's a mental crutch. God, I, I, I don't even understand this, God. You know, you're asking me to do something. I don't understand it. You know, my mind's not there yet. So I, I, I can't comprehend what you're asking me to do. So, God, you understand. I'm, I'm just going to kind of, you know, let this one pass. Maybe it's a social crutch. You know, social God, I'm not very good out in public. I'm not very good in people and blah, 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 blah. And we kind of justify and excuse and rationalize why we don't have to do what God has asked us to do. But here's the deal. As long as we are leaning on any type of crutch, it reveals that our faith and trust is not in God. You see, so often we, we see this uh, exemplified in our youth. We have children coming up through the church or in our families, and we say, wow, you're really good with kids, so you should be a teacher. Oh, you're really good with your hands, so you should be a welder or a mechanic or a... Oh, you're really good at things, so you should be... And we kind of look, and, and here's what I mean to say this. I'm not saying it's wrong, but what I'm saying is, if all we do in life is what we think we know we can do, you will not depend on God to do what He's asked you to do. Because if I have the ability to do it, what do I need to trust him for? I mean, after all, you're already gifted in that area, so I'll go ahead and just continue on my way doing what I know I'm good at. Sometimes God may ask you to do something that you're not good at. 
He may ask you to do something that you've never done before. He may ask you to go someplace that you don't know where it's at. He may be asking you to simply step out and say, I trust you, God, I will follow. And it has absolutely nothing to do with your abilities, your skills, your experiences, or anything else. Because it's all about you being obedient and trusting God to do what he's asked you to do. And Moses is still learning, leaning on this crutch of, God, you know, they don't listen to me and I really don't know what to say and I'm, not a, poor, I'm a very poor speaker. And as long as he's leaning on this crutch, he feels like he's got this justification as to just, oh, I'm going to back off and let someone else do this. I don't believe that that was what God had for him. Maybe your crutch is your past. Sometimes I have parents tell me, well, my kids do this, and they say, well, you did it in your past. Too bad. The past is not a crutch. It's not a buy to let you buy, continue doing what you've done. Past is past. These things I've put behind me, reaching forth the things that are yet to come, right? Bottom line is, I don't lean on the past either. No more crutches. But I'm reminded of verses like Job 33.12, 33, which says, God is greater than man. The bottom line is, I'm not about pleasing man, I'm about pleasing God. 1 John 4.4, 4, the one who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So once again, it's not about my abilities, my skills, not about what I think I'm good at. It's not about whether or not I think I'm a good communicator. It's not about whether I think I have the skill set to perform this task. Because greater is he that is in you as a child of God than he that is in the world. It's not about what I think I can handle. It's about trusting God who lives within us, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God be for us, then who can be against us? What we need to understand is that when God calls us to a task, when God asks us to do something, understand that God's will will be performed despite what we think man can do. Philippians 1.6, God will be the one who will complete the task that he has started. Remember? Having this confidence that he who begins a work in us will complete it. What that ought to do for every one of us is that when God calls us to do anything, whatever it may be, I don't care whether it's working in that factory or whether it's uh, you know, in, in the streets of India, sweeping the streets, whatever it is that God calls you to do, it's about obedience, it's about trusting God, and letting God do what He wants to do, what He wants to do through us. It's not about us. It's not about our own wills. It's all about what God is wanting to do in and through us. But here's what God says, and this is what we need to be reminded of. In, the, in the Exodus chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, Then God spoke to Moses, telling him, I am Yahweh. He says, I am Yahweh. Is there any other speech that's better than that in confronting the, air, confronting the Pharaoh? Remember what he said back when he called him? He says, well, what am I supposed to say? He said, you said, I am has sent me unto you. That's the bottom line. It's all about God, and we're going to direct everybody's attention to him, and which, was, which is one thing we're supposed to be doing today in all of our dealings, directing our attention to God. He says, I am has sent me unto you. So he says in, in, in Exodus 6, verse 2, I am Yahweh. And in verse 5, he goes on to say this, Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are forcing to work as slaves. I have remembered my covenant. Man, he says, I know everything that's going on. I know everything that's taken place. I've heard the complaints. I've heard the griping. I know everything that's going on. There's nothing that you can tell me that I don't know. Why is that important? Because he says, I'm Yahweh. I'm the one that can do something about it. I'm the one that can do something about this situation. So there's this first principle that God tells Moses that he is going to see what he can do. And then... God tells Moses that Pharaoh will drive out his children. He says it again in verse 1. But the Lord replied to Moses, Now you are going to see what I will do. That's the first one. And then he says, He will let them go because my strong hand. God tells Moses that Pharaoh will drive out his children. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, he says, We are reminded that God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Think about that just for a moment. 
If God says he's going to do something, guess what? He's going to do it. Because God cannot lie. We need to remember that. If God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, guess what? He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. If God says, I'm going to be there to encourage you, guess what? God will be there to encourage you. I found in my life, as young as I am, that God is faithful, even when I'm not. He's faithful when I'm not. It's not God that moves. He's reminded the children of Israel over and over and over. He goes, when you seek me, I'm found. But if you don't seek me, guess what? I'm not there. You don't miss what you don't have. But God is there. And he reminds them over and over. Titus 1, 2. God cannot lie. We need to take him at his word. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not man who can lie, or a son of man, that he changes his mind. Does he not speak and not act? Or does he not promise and not fulfill? God is a man, or God is a God of his word. And what he says is true. What he says he will accomplish, he will accomplish. And Moses needed to be reminded, just like you and me, that God is faithful. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 19, remember when we looked at that just briefly? The king will not let them go except by a strong hand. He says, you can say all you want, Moses, and I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to point him to me. I want you to say that I am has sent me unto you. I want you to go to him and confront him and demand that the children be released. But guess what? He's not going to do it except by a strong hand. Well, then why are you sending me? Because I said to go. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 31, Get up, leave my people, both you and the Israelites. Eventually, he gets it, that God's in control, not himself. But see, it happened in God's timing, not Moses' timing. That's something for us to be reminded of. God does not always work in our timing. I wish he would, but he just doesn't sometimes. Doesn't that irritate you? Let's be honest. We want what we want when we want it. And Moses wanted to go. Yeah, somebody downstairs heard that. <laughs> Woo! We want to go forward and want what we want when we want it because that's what we feel like we have the right to get. We live in America, right? I mean, this is in, we're entitled to this. And that's not how it works with God. Sometimes God has other plans, and most of the time God's plans are better. Well, not most of the time, all the time. God's plans are better than ours. We just can't see it sometimes. But over and over, God's got something he's working on. He says, I'm Yahweh. I know everything. And then the third principle here is that God tells Moses what to tell the Israelites. We see this in chapter 6, verse 6. Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am Yahweh, and I will deliver you from the forced labor of the Egyptians and free you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. You will know that I am Yahweh, your God who delivered you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and I will give it to you as a possession. I am Yahweh. Moses told this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their broken spirit and hard labor. They were so beaten down from the forced labor. And let's just say it this way, the communication barriers were up between Moses and the children of Israel. They were a little ticked at Moses. Moses was a little ticked at God. Things weren't just like flowing perfectly smooth at this moment. But he says, I want you to know I'm going to work. I'm going to work. So Moses needed the reminder of who he was. And so did the Israelites. And here's what he says, I will deliver you. And then he says, I will redeem you. He says, I will take you as my people, and I will bring you to the land that I swore to you. Over and over, God continues to remind the children of Israel that I'm in control. And I will do exactly what I said I will do. Over and over and over again. So Moses Go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. We see that again in chapter 6 and verse 11. He says this. Go 
Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go from his land. Moses leans on this crutch just for a moment. Verse 12. But Moses said in the Lord's presence, If the Israelites will not listen to me, then how will Pharaoh listen to me? Since I am such a poor speaker. Just for a moment, he wants to take that crutch one more time. God, listen. You, you've called me to lead these children out. They won't listen to me. How in the world? Pharaoh ain't going to listen to me. He says, you just do what I ask you to do. You just do what I've asked you to do. And then he says down in verse 28, we see some genealogy here in the middle of chapter 6. But look down in verse 28. On the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, he said to him, I am Yahweh. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything that I am telling you. Think about this. There was a day of anticipation coming. I mean, God was going to... Remember, Exodus chapter 3 says, I want to take you out of this land and bring you into a better land that flows with milk and honey. He says, I have something better for you. Moses, go tell Pharaoh everything that I've told you. It's amazing. Moses didn't quite get it. And before we jump all over him, can I just say sometimes we don't get it either. Sometimes God's asks us and we just don't understand. I remember with, I know I told one story with Jake, but one more story, it's in my notes here. But why? But why? You ever heard you, your kids ask you that question? But why? Especially when they're real little. When Jake was little, he would say, I would say something to, uh, to him to which he would reply, but why? Uh, here's what I've learned. I would try to explain to him, to the best of my ability, to which he would reply, but why? <laughs> and then I would take another couple of minutes and explain it to him. He goes, but why? And then I would take another couple of minutes and explain it to him. He goes, but why? Here's what I learned. If I just said because, he said, okay. <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to take the time. <laughs> After everything that God had told Moses, he still, in essence, was asking, but why? It seems as though we always want a reason as to why we should do something that we're told to do. You've seen it with your kids. You've seen it with, in your own lives. You have a boss, an employer, a, or an, uh, a supervisor, uh, you know, somebody who's in charge of your division or department or whatever, and they want, they want you to do something, and you, in your mind you go, why? This doesn't make any sense. This is dumb. This, 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 there's no reason to rhyme to this. We all do it. We always want a reason as to why we should do something that we're told to do. I think it's our human nature. And I don't think it was any different with Moses. After all the excuses, Moses asked God, why would Pharaoh have listened to me? Why should I... God simply, lovingly reminds Moses why Pharaoh will listen to him. Chapter 4, verse 16. But in the eyes of Pharaoh, it will be as though Moses will be a god and Aaron will be his prophet. God called Moses to lead his children out of bondage and gave him complete authority to do the task at hand. And Moses was not divine as God, but to Pharaoh, Moses having his own prophet showed Pharaoh that he had divine authority. And Aaron had already been prepared for the task that God had for him as well. We saw that back in chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, that God said, I will tell him what to speak. He will be a voice for you. Let me just give you a couple notes of interest. Number one, we are all God's ambassadors. In um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 20, he says this, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. We are his ambassadors. Just as Moses was to be an ambassador for the children of Israel, an ambassador for God, 
That's a task we need to take. We have a task to do. It's not about just a story in the Old Testament where God was trying to free his children. It's a principle that we need to learn as well. That God is at work. He's called us to be his ambassador as well. Philip Graham Ryken, in his commentary on Exodus, wrote this. It was actually a, a restatement of what D.L. Moody said. He says, Moses is into his 80s at this point. And D.L. Moody observed that Moses spent 40 years in Pharaoh's court thinking that he was somebody. 40 years in the desert learning that he was nobody. And 40 showing what God can do with somebody who found out he was nobody. Isn't that awesome? He's beginning to realize that, okay, God, you are going to get your way. Growing up in the palace of the king and then refusing to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter and then taking matters into his own hand and killing the Egyptian. So 40 years, then 40 years, then the last 40 years fulfilling what God has called him to do. He begins to realize that what, a nobody, what somebody who knows he's a nobody can do with God's help. No matter our age, we need to be asking God how he wants to use us. How does God want to use you? Remember again, we've been talking about this analogy over and over the last several weeks. It's hard to hear someone yelling from the third floor when the other person they're yelling at is in the basement. You can yell as loud as you want, but the bottom line, it's hard to hear. But when do those two people hear each other clearly? When they're close together. When are you going to hear what God wants you to do? When you are drawing close to him. That's the principle. As long as you are walking close in fellowship with God, you can hear him speak. How does God speak to us? Through his word. How do we speak to God? Through prayer. And when we're close, we can hear that. But if you're distant, one's speaking, the other one's not listening, or vice versa, you don't know what, what each other wants. Moses' day of anticipation is at hand. He is realizing that not only will Pharaoh not listen, but God has actually hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that he would not listen. We see that in chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. It says this, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and Pharaoh will not listen to you. But I will put my hand on Egypt and bring the divisions of my people, the Israelites, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. God is about to un unveil his, his justice and his power. And simply put, Moses just needed to be obedient. He just needed to do what God was asking him to do. God would take care of all the details. He'd take care of all the rest. He just simply needed to obey. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says this, A person should consider us in this way, as servants of Christ and managers of God's mysteries. In this regard, it is expected of managers that each one of them be found faithful. That's what God expects of us. God doesn't want you to control the outcome. That's in his court. God will take care of the details if we will take care of obedience. God just wants us to be faithful. Moses' day of anticipation is here. He's realizing that not only will Pharaoh not listen, but his heart has been hardened. And now God is beginning to do everything that he said he would do one step at a time. How do I know that? Because verses 4 and 5 says, Pharaoh will not listen to you, but I will put my hand on Egypt. He says, I'll, hey, it's not about you, Moses. Just, just go tell him what I'm saying. You just go tell him what I'm going to do. Verse 5, the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the Israelites from among them. Remember, he said, they're not going to let them go except by a strong hand. They're about to see the strong hand. Um, it says, I will stretch out my hand and Egypt will know that I am Yahweh. In fact, he says this over and over. He constantly reminds them of this principle. Chapter 8, verse 10. Uh, 
Moses replied, um, so let me see here, chapter, yeah, chapter 8, verse 10. Tomorrow, he answered, Moses replied, as you have said, so you may know that there is no one like Yahweh our God. He says, tomorrow, you're going to find out that there's nobody. Chapter 9 and verse 14, he says, otherwise, I am going to send all my plagues against you, your officials and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Uh, chapter 6, or verse 16 same, same uh, chapter, he says, However, I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make known my name in all the earth. Uh, verse 29. Moses said to him, When I have left the city, I will extend my hands to Yahweh. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know the earth belongs to Yahweh. Going to chapter 14 and so forth. Over and over he says, You will know. You will know. You will know. And I think the truth still remains today is that God wants us to understand who he is. Look at verse 9 with this we'll close. Chapter 9, I'm sorry, chapter 8 and verse 9. Ch chapter 7 and verse 9, excuse me. It says, When Pharaoh tells you perform a miracle, tell Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh. It will become a serpent. Over and over now, God's beginning to use things that one can only imagine. A rod? Yeah. A rod. And the thing is, the power that was in Moses that God was using him to perform was through God. It was God's power revealed. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the power that the magicians had used was through Satan. And here's the deal. The truth will be declared in the end. In the end, they will know who God is. To me, it's an amazing story that's beginning to unfold. Next week, we're going to hit the what we took several weeks to do. We're going to do just in one sermon next week on the plagues. But they're going to be able to begin to see what God is doing. They're going to begin to see the power of God. And the question still comes to my mind. Was it Moses' ability? No. Was it that Moses was just so supernaturally, incredibly charismatic and just a big brute of a guy, you know, that he, would, that he could take matters in his own hand and destroy another man? Was it just that he was just so physically awesome? No. It's probably quite the opposite. I think he struggled with the very things that you and I struggle with. Obedience. Trusting what he couldn't see. Taking God at his word. Even when we don't understand it. But ultimately seeing God do what only God can do. That's where we live. That's most of us in our everyday life. Every day, another opportunity to step forward in obedience and trust in God. How are you doing with that? What crutches have you leaned on as excuses not to do what God's asked you to do? Maybe this morning you say, well, I don't know what God's asked me to do. Well, the question is, maybe, one's you up there, well, maybe one of you is upstairs and the other one's in the basement. Maybe you get close so you can hear. But what is God asking you to do? What's he asking you to be? What areas of obedience have you not followed through on? So that God can show himself strong. It's not about you. And even after you do it, it doesn't change the fact it's not about you. Over and over he says, I'm doing this so that they may know that I am God. He says, Moses, I'm not doing this so that they'll all follow you. I'm not doing this so that they think you're pretty awesome and cool and great leader. I'm doing this so that they may know that I am God. God does what he does for himself. And even if he chooses to use you, it's still not about you. It's all about him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, you know our hearts. You know the very things that we struggle with. Lord, you know the things that really in so many ways distract us from doing what's right. You know the very things that we use as crutches in our life to not do what you've asked us to do. I pray, God, you forgive us. 
Lord, I don't know what you're asking many people to do in this room, but I know that every one of us struggle with faithful, consistent obedience. Every day, a new day, just to follow, to surrender, to trust. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, and help us to know those things in our life, Lord, that are causing us to be distracted from what you have for us. Whether it's our own personal sinfulness or our excuses that we make or not trusting you, Lord, whatever it may be, I pray, God, that you might reveal it so that we can deal with it and move forward. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just ask for